Back in January, we asked if history still mattered, if we were living in a world where we cared less about the past. A group of historians and journalists shared their thoughts, and tonight, a group of Ontario school teachers share theirs. And with that, we welcome Neil Orford. He's a secondary school teacher with the Upper Grant District School Board. That's about an hour northwest of Toronto. Marcy McRae, secondary school teacher with the Durham District School Board. Jan Haskings Winner, secondary school teacher with the Toronto District School Board and president of the Ontario History and Social Science Teachers Association. Jack, okay Jack, Cecilin? Cecilon. Cecilon. Knew I'd get close, but knew I wouldn't make it. Jack Cecilon, secondary school teacher with the Durham Catholic District School Board and Ruth Ann Turnbull, who's a retired elementary school teacher from the Simcoe Muskoka Catholic District School Board. They don't make these names any shorter these days, do they? No, well, when you keep amalgamating, you That's get what more, happens. That's or what you happens. Keep growing. Hey, good of all of you to come into TVO tonight for this discussion, which happens as a result of a program, as I suggested, we did back in January, where we had a bunch of people in. And in that discussion, Matt Gurney, whom some of you would know from his columns in the National Post, he's on News Talk 1010 from time to time, he was talking about an incident where his wife, who's an elementary school teacher, and her grade seven history textbook became a thing. And here's the thing, roll tape. I remember flipping through the history textbook, which I, obviously as a teacher, she had a copy of it. And I remember thinking, I mean, I'm a guy with two degrees in history. I put down the textbook, I'm like, this is awful. Like, I am totally bored by the story of this country because there's no story here. It's a, it's a collection of random figures and some anecdotes that don't really uh, come together in any coherent way. It's very, it's very delicate. It's like, well, there were native peoples here and bad things happened, but we won't dwell on that. And there are two major language groups in this country and they don't always get along, but let's not get into the nitty gritty of that. It was just, it was totally averse to controversy, anything exciting or Pablum. dramatic. It was Pablum at its worst. And you know, uh, my own experience going back about 15 years now, our school wasn't much better. It was basically the, the history of Canada was Confederation, Vimy Ridge, hippies were done. And, you know, <laughs> by the time you get... It was, it was interesting enough. I mean, it got better in the latter third. But uh, by the time you actually get to the university level, I mean, if you, are, if you have a love for history, you've found it on your own. Okay, that's funny, but it's not, as we know. So, Marcy, let's just start off with first principles here. Is he right? Well, I want to clarify that I'm a secondary teacher, so my familiarity with the elementary textbook is my own from I don't know how many years ago. Gotcha. Um, there, there definitely is a tendency of textbooks that we give to kids to steer away from controversy. Um, as I mentioned earlier to your producer, I said sometimes as a history teacher I feel like I'm a cheerleader for the government. And, Why do you feel that? Um, because the expectation is that you want them to walk away respecting Canadian history and respecting the contributions of those that came before it, but there is a tendency in the textbook not to look carefully at the errors that were made by the Canadian government or by Canadian society as a whole. So I do agree with him, yes, it does steer away from controversy and sometimes that does mean that it seems bland. Yeah, I guess, Ruthann, if you steer away from controversy, you're taking a lot of the meat and potato, a lot of the stuff that makes it interesting out of it, right? Yes, and, in, and the other thing too, the, the textbooks are not renewed as often as maybe they should be. So new information coming oh. is not always included, so you have to source it out yourself. Um, the last time I saw the history textbook in a grade 7 class, it was most of them were minus one of the covers and they were old and they hadn't quite got around to the, it was more important, I guess, maybe to have a new math textbook or a new science textbook, and the history kind of fell, fell down the, the line. So you are speaking to the idea that history has been de-emphasized, or decision makers think it's less well, important the, now? Um, the, I primarily taught grade four, five, six, sometimes seven, if you had a split six, seven class, right? Mm -hmm. But. Um, the emphasis on literacy and numeracy has pushed really everything else to the side and then they've brought, they came back with, um, in the last years that I was teaching, the science curriculum was revised and, and I know that there's a new history curriculum out there but again, it, it, it's only as good as the professional development and mm. the resources that go okay. into bringing in a new curriculum. I see a lot of heads nodding. Okay, Jack, the Matt Gurney clip, what did you think when you heard it? Uh, I think there's always a certain political correctness to um, 
to textbooks. And I think our job as the frontline players is to inject that extra energy into it. And the textbook is meant to be a support in the classroom. It's not the foundation, though. I think that the teacher plays that foundational role in so trying to start get with the you. students. It has to. I don't see how you can go about injecting life into a class by saying, read pages, so-and-so, and, -so, and, uh, and engage by reading that material. Some students, uh, their literacy skills are stronger than others. Some are already going to buy into the program. Our job, in some ways, is to try and sell our nation's story to the, to the students and make it exciting. And I'm a firm believer that uh, if we're excited about it, if we're engaged, if we're, if we're knowledgeable about the subject, it, we've been given the torch. Our task is to pass that torch on to the students. And that means we have to have a fire. If we don't have a fire, how can we possibly pass that energy and that enthusiasm for our nation's story onto students who know nothing about our story? Neil, you see it that way? Yeah, I, I'm tempted to, to uh, I hear exactly what Jack's saying. I'm tempted to say, does a history textbook have to be interesting in order to be worthy? Uh, but that aside, um, I, I have sympathy with textbook authors because they do write for publishers. They don't always write for students. They write for a publication team that has to be, uh, you know, that has to be acknowledged in, 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 in how the textbook is written. So I, I'm sympathetic to them. But by the same token, uh, the textbooks are in many cases very busy. Uh, they're lacking narrative. The narrative is, is lost sometimes in the clutter of a textbook. There has to be a flying window over here and a, a web link over here. And that's challenging for kids, as Jack says, that sometimes have uh, language issues. So you have to be thoughtful about that when you're writing a textbook. But the teacher is there to make the textbook sing. The teacher is there to make the textbook work. And so you use the textbook to the extent that it should be textbook. If, you, if it becomes your hymn book, then I think you have a problem in the classroom. Uh, but I would, you know, I would still, I would also say that I think there's a, a real need in the country for people to uh, uh, begin, historians begin to write uh, textbooks that, that, that capture the Canadian narrative as it's reflected in the 21st century. And I don't think we're seeing that in, in, in any meaningful high school history textbook literature right now, much less in, in, in elementary school hmm. literature. Jen, what's your view? Well, I mean, I'm going to sort of challenge a couple of things because I think there's, to say there's one narrative, I think is oversimplifying our history because there's many stories mm -hmm. and I think that's part of our job is to make sure that that, that is part of it. And I mean, and, and I would also challenge his, um, Matt's sort of assumption that it's all um, pablum, to, you know, because I, in fact, our history is very much not pablum. Just because we don't kill people off all the time doesn't make us, and there are examples where we have, um, doesn't make it, a non part of, of the story. I mean, I'm just I've just finished teaching the war to my my ten applied class. Which war? World War II. Thank you. And um, and they're they're so engaged in understanding. They, we're talking about the internment of the Japanese Canadians as part of our story. And, and I have a student born in Japan in my class, hmm. and he did not know about that part of the story. And the rest of the class is interested because of his story, right? I mean, it's all part of that piece. And to, to make, help them understand, you know, the cause of that, but, and also the consequences. And that's the piece I think that, w as history teachers, we want students to have a better understanding of, not when was the War of 1812? Who cares, right? <laughs> well, hang on, if you can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my point, right? Yeah. Anybody could pull up their phone and answer that question mm -hmm. in a nanosecond, right? We want kids to understand what were the causes and the consequences, both the intended and the unintended. Yeah. And getting into that deeper thinking piece of of our of history, and not just Canadian history, because there's other histories that we teach sure. as well. But we're talking about Canadian. I history. totally get that. But one of the things that emerged from that program that we did back in January was one of our guests, who was it? Diane Pecon from the University of Ottawa. She said today's generation doesn't see any value in learning about things that happened, oh, let's say, more than ten minutes ago. What do you do with that? Well, that's our I job. I, I disagree. I don't agree. I disagree. You don't agree? Yes. Oh. Don't no, agree. it's totally not, not true. That. No, yes. there are lots no. of kids interested. Yes. It, but, but again, it's, it may be more selective. Uh, uh, 2014. Uh, 20, you know, sorry, 2012. Yeah, no, 200th anniversary of. Or the 100th, yeah. But we're, I don't think that coming this year with the beginning of the First World War, that um, especially in the elementary panel, I don't think there's... Uh, uh, a move to to recognize that anniversary. Um, the last year I taught. Wait a sec. Can I stop you there? We're a hundred years from the. We're almost a hundred years from the start of World War One. And 
nobody's learning about this in elementary school? No, because uh, Canadian history in the elementary panel ends in 1914. Mm -hmm. It ends in 1914. Yes, they leave it up to the high school to deal with. Grade 10. Yeah, grade 10 picks it up. So, uh, so unless you're doing something around Remembrance Day, there's no place to talk about it. And your point is, we should, we should at least be adaptable to do. significant things that are happening, okay, anniversaries so and so on. Okay, so one of the best history sort of um, units that I ever did was on the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. Mm -hmm. A grade four or five class, non-readers to readers, the use of technology. The kids were so interested. We were going to spend a couple weeks on it. We ended up spending almost two months on it. Was it in the curriculum? No. So you made the decision to put that there. Well, there was enough wiggle room in the, cur in the curriculum that I could go and say, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this. I also linked it to my language unit. Uh, I also linked it to my visual arts unit. Uh, so again, we, and, and because of what we found out about the um, coroner out of Halifax, who's um, came up with the way of identifying the, and numbering the, the, when they went out to go and find the dead, mm. we found out he, that same method was used at 9-11. Huh. But we don't teach. Brings it to today. You look like you want it. to get in there. Well, it's, it, you know, we have a wonderful opportunity over the next four or five years because of the, because of all yeah. the commemorative opportunities yeah. we have with, uh, with the First and Second World War. There's no question about that. I, and and um, Confederation. Right. And Confederation, yeah, yeah. ultimately. Well, and yesterday, the, the birthday of Toronto. Toronto. It well, was, I, I think one of the other things that Diane mentioned, and, and, and I may be stealing from something you're going to say later on, but I think one of the things that Diane, Diane mentioned in her interview was that the, the past has wisdom. And I think where you can capture kids, uh, whether you're using a textbook or not, where you capture kids, of course, is this notion of there's wisdom in the past. And part of our jobs as teachers, of course, is to, is to enlighten them to those, to those wonderful big ideas that are out there, that are in the past, that have tremendous currency and rele relevance today. And so whether you're doing it through a commemorative activity, which is, which is sort of a gateway activity into something bigger uh, uh, or not, it's, it's one of your responsibilities as a teacher to, to capture that moment. And I think, I think the kids are ripe for it. I think they, they, they see this on the internet. I think they're constantly in that world. And they understand that, that, that there are big ideas out there that they want to know about. So it's our job to deliver them. Jack, when I mentioned that, though, that the students, at least in Professor Pacon's class, didn't appear to be tremendously interested in what had happened in the past because they thought it had no value. You were one of the people who sort of got in my kitchen here and said, no, no, not true at all, they do. You see evidence of it? I do see evidence of it. I think the story of history isn't just, I mean, it has its political side with conflict, but it also it's a story about young people's lives a long time ago. It's the, it's the story of conflict. It's the story of medicine. It's the story of sports and fashion. There's so many different forces coming in. It's the story of different cultural groups in Canada trying to get along even 100 years ago. And to suggest that uh, they're not concerned about what happened any more than 10 minutes ago, uh, five, about five, six years ago, I took 31 students to Vimy Ridge for the 90th anniversary. And the, just the sense of respect uh, when we had a moment of silence and everything, I just don't buy that. I think that students, if they're given an engaging story, from the past, they will buy into it, and they will, uh, they'll be reverent, and they'll, they'll take it and they'll make it their own, and uh, they won't discard it so that they can look at their next text message or something. I think that there is something engaging in our history. Uh, our challenge is, though, to dig up those controversies and those conflicts and those, those nation-building moments. But that's extraordinary, taking kids to Vimy on, on such an occasion. How did that come together? Well, I mean, it took a, a number of teachers who love doing what they do, mm -hmm. and we decided we're going to take them overseas. And, and they had to pay for their own trips. They I had to pay mm -hmm. for their own trips, and, they, and many of them had to save their own money and convince their parents to help them out and their relatives. Right. And uh, Were there people who couldn't go because they couldn't afford to go? Yes, of course. There were. And, uh, but the, the point being here is that there, it wasn't just a trip overseas. It was so focused. It was a history trip. Mm -hmm. We... Every moment of it was uh, really a story of our country overseas and, and their interest and uh, the overwhelming welcome that we got there What kind well. of bureaucratic hoops did you have to jump through to make that trip happen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot of paperwork. You have to be very organized. There's certainly legal documents that have to be signed, uh, power of attorney, for example. But uh, 
look, I think that being a history teacher means taking risks. We certainly <laughs> did take risks by going overseas with over 30 teenagers. I Every, mean, everybody come back? Everybody came back, yes. Uh, oh boy, you didn't say that very confidently. Everybody, <laughs> everybody came, back. came back happy and healthy, and um, I think we might have had a customs issue with somebody <laughs> trying to bring something in, but it wasn't oh, illegal. <laughs> it was not illegal. It was not no. illegal. Okay. That's well, right. but let's follow up on this for a second. Uh, that's extraordinary to be able to take that many students to a place where history happened. Uh, you know, if you can't sell history in those kind of circumstances, you, you know, you fill in the blank. What about regular every day? Do you see evidence every day in your regular history teachings that suggests that young people are, see value in what happened before mm -hmm. they got here? Some do, some don't. Um, what I find helpful is I, um, Someone mentioned conflict, and young people definitely um, deal with conflict every day. Conflict with their teachers, conflict with their peers, conflict with their parents. And so sometimes if you present um, a concept in the framework of a, of, a, of a conflict between two groups of people, they go, oh, yeah, I understand why someone would feel that way, or, or I sympathize with them. But even if you ask them something simple, like, why do you think your parents feel this way about this particular topic? And they say, I don't know. Parents are just weird. Like, I don't know why they think that. Or why do your grandparents hoard things? Or why, why are your grandparents parents seem so cheap to you is it maybe because they went through this experience in the 1930s and 40s mm. and they go oh and so they begin to realize that the people who are around them who do influence them who, who do have some measure control over them were influenced by far greater events and oh look it's here in our textbook and now we're going to talk about it mm. so I would say that yes it is easy to sell um, these big concepts or these big events to teenagers by saying you know you think it didn't have anything to do with you but trust me when I say that yes it has influenced your life or when you ask them well we have this particular service in, um, from the government if you're talking about post-war Canada why do we now have OHIP why do we why do we now have social services it's because of this person or this political party's idea and they begin to realize that the past is everywhere around us and it does affect us every day hmm. we actually uh, producer Mark Rosens put the call out on the, the internet to find some students who would talk about this kind of stuff and we had a bunch of reactions and we brought some of them into our studio the other day sat them down clipped some microphones on them and asked them about some of the things we're going to talk about tonight and throughout the course of our discussion we're going to play a few clips just so you can have something to react to here as well this is um, University of Toronto student uh, Michelle Di Fiori who's talking about her favorite high school teacher her history teacher, Mr. Campbell. Roll tape. How many teachers like Mr. Campbell would have diverted from the textbook and just done their own thing? Yeah, it's very rare, I think. And I think that's what made him stand apart as especially a high school teacher. I think that's extremely rare. Um, we seldom had like notes on the board. It was mainly him lecturing. And I don't even recall really reading the textbook a lot at all. Everything I've retained, and I still know I remember in his um, his lectures and his notorious anecdotes. He would tell like funny little stories and that makes it interesting for you know high school kids So so into themselves to pay attention to these historical moments. I think is very engaging Jan Ruthann told us a while ago that she went off the page to talk about the Titanic even though it wasn't in the curriculum Do you need to do that to be a good history teacher? I think I think what you want to always do is make connections for kids mm -hmm. and, and make it relevant to them So how you do that varies from from class to class student to student opportunities, right? I think you always want to have, our goal is not to, to memorize the facts. Our goal is to help students understand and be critical thinkers. I mean, I think part of what history does best compared to other disciplines, maybe I'm biased, I probably am, that it helps develop critical thinkers, that kids look at evidence and make their own decisions. And you have to go off the page to make that happen? And you have to go, you have to go beyond the page, I think. And I mean, and I, I, mean, I don't, I mean, I, I think textbooks have a purpose because when you don't have a textbook, and I do it in a couple of my classes, I'm constantly finding photocopies. We don't have, the internet's not our big savior yet. It's maybe 10, 20 years, but at the moment, you still have to have something to do when you're to, to think about. The, the challenge, I think, is, I mean, and I was having students um, look at the death of Dudley George and ask the question, was the death of Dudley George worth Worth it. Like, was it was a game? Just remind everybody, this oh, is 1995, oh, Ipper Wash, Ipper Wash Provincial yes. Park. Sorry, thank you. In, yes. Uh, Western I, Ontario, and he was an Aboriginal, the, the one Aboriginal man killed, by, killed. Yes, as a result of that. And the students, and we're looking at some of the evidence and primary source evidence, and they said, but where's the answer? Hmm. <laughs> I said, I said, right. well, the answer is, it's, the answer is not an answer, right? You have to kind of come up with your own conclusion and support it based on the evidence. And that was when it was, it was May 
you know, of the course. And they finally went, aha. <laughs> it took me that long to be able to get them to think for themselves that the answer is not you know, in the third paragraph on the page, that you have to look at evidence, you have to think for yourself, you have to make conclusions, you have to support it. And that's what I think we want students to come out of. And whether you use you know, a textbook that has some information in it, whether you use um, a television program, whether you use a newspaper article, it doesn't matter what it is, it's kind of helping students move their thinking along. I think that somebody's mentioned the revised curriculum that we have for, for Ontario in, in history, um, which just has just arrived, actually. In the elementary, they got theirs in June, and the secondary got theirs in August you know, for this current school year, which is not much time to start sort of looking at it. But I think it has a huge, it's a huge paradigm shift for teachers and what they're going to do in their classrooms, because it was a lot more of the knowledge content piece and I think the inquiry approach and the thinking concepts, the historical thinking concepts that are built in in the history side. Um, and education is provincial in Canada, yep. but most of the provinces are adapting to this concept of the historical thinking as an important part of what we do in our classrooms. Gotcha. Neil, can you recall a moment where, as Jan just described it, you go at it, you go at it, you go at it, it seems to just wash over their heads and then all of a sudden, the penny drops, and they have this realization, ah, this is why history is important. Does that happen? Well, the first part of what you said, I was going to say every day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, sure. I mean, I, mean, I, think, I think that's, that's, our, that's our food. That's our food source. We, we, we live for those moments when the penny drops, uh, or I like to say when the page turns and, and, and you see some real recognition on the part of the students. Uh, and it does happen more often than I think uh, the popular media or... Uh, Michelle's anecdotes or anybody else's anecdotes would have us uh, believe. I think it happens quite regularly. And I don't think students have an, an aha moment necessarily. But I think, as Jan suggests, they make connections. And, and I'm not sure that we can ask for a whole lot more in, in high school uh, uh, in any subject than to uh, uh, lead the students to a point where they can make those connections. Hmm. You know, you'd want that in math, obviously, and we have a, a huge controversy about math in Ontario right now, and I think that's what math teachers struggle with on a, on a daily basis. But, but certainly that's the point at which you, you want to bring students to. And, and some of these ideas, some of these uh, um, uh, uh, connections that they make will sit with them for a long time, as they should. Hmm. And they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll grow and they'll grow and they'll grow as they grow. Um, I, I, don't, I don't mean to turn kids into, uh, into uh, uh, you know, saviors or, or into some kind of political activist in my classroom. I mean to make them an engaged citizen in, in a nation state, which is called Canada. And I want to come back to something Richard Gwynn had said in that, uh, in that uh, episode, which, which I, I think we oftentimes uh, do beat ourselves up too much. Uh, we live in a fantastic country, and we live in a very successful country. And the students, uh, Michelle, and, and, and all of us around the table are all products of a history curriculum and a history program in moderately successful schools across the province and across the country who've done a darn good job. So, you know, I, I don't think we want to beat ourselves up too much. We've done pretty darn well. Can we do better? Of course we can. Marcy, I wonder if there's a sense out there that you have to have a particular set of skills to teach, for example, math or chemistry or physics or you know what I'm getting at, but that anybody can teach history. <laughs> <laughs> the laughs around the table suggest to me that you don't agree Respectfully, with that. Respectfully, I disagree. Right. Um, history teachers become very offended when people say something like that. And uh, the, I guess... I guess the reason why some people may assume that is because, well, everybody took history and everybody knows a certain amount and everybody can read, so you can really put any teacher with any qualification in front of a history class and it'll work. Um, it may not because that, for example, personality. A history teacher typically is a person who's curious. They want to know why. It's not enough for them to know what, they want to know why we arrived at that particular state. So if you have a, a person who is not curious or who is not feeling adventurous or for, for the fact they're in a classroom where they don't know the curriculum and they feel very nervous about it and they're not going to venture far from the textbook, well then those 30 kids are going to finish the school year having only learnt what's in the textbook and not had an opportunity to engage with that teacher's passions because their passion may be physics and not history. Um, there is a reason why teachers have qualifications. There is a reason why we have specializations and it's because you want a person who's well-versed 
to work with your child. Just like you wouldn't go to a dentist who did chiropractic school, uh, <laughs> you, want, you want to go to someone who has a specialization. And we're very fortunate in Ontario that we expect our high school teachers to be specialists. Now that's high school. Ruth Ann, what about elementary? Less specialization there, yes? Yes, but also too, when you look at the elementary curriculum, it's different. There's more opportunities to integrate across the curriculum and I think that's when you get the most bang for your buck is that when you are able to teach history as language or teach history as music. I think one of the most successful ones I had was a Remembrance Day assignment, The Trues, the song Highway of Heroes. Mm -hmm. I bought the CD, they had to give credit, they used garage band. They had to take one minute of that song and create uh, a montage for presentation in the gym for Remembrance Day. They had to have a World War I vet. They had to have a Canadian flag. They had to have a World War II vet. They had to have a peacekeeper. They had to have something from Afghanistan. Hmm. So the kids got into it, seven and eight students. We found out a, a number of things. Did you know that the 401 is really the McDonald Carchet Freeway? Huh? Who are those guys? <laughs> Why is it named Open that? Open the door. Why is it named the Highway of Heroes? Okay. Um, that was November. The following, I think it was July, was in the supermarket, across the road from the school, and the kid that was bagging my garbage said, uh, garbage, my, uh, groceries. My, my groceries said to me, you're that teacher. You did the Highway of Heroes. Did you know that it's because of you that my sister dragged us down to stand on a ridge. <laughs> and that is one of the most emotional things you'll ever see. He the says, people I don't standing know on the bridge while the caskets go by. I don't know whether to thank you or not. Yeah. It was cold that day. It was one of the last that came home that way. And you know you've made it when hmm. out of, I think there was three grade seven, eight classes that did that project. So that's almost. 60, 70 students. So you had an impact. You had an impact. That's not bad. Not bad. You know? That's a good day at the office, isn't it? It was. And, mm -hmm. and I found that, that if you can find something that engages them, these grade 7 and 8 students just went with it. And what? they didn't have to be totally uh, confident in their language skills. But they stood up, they had to stand up in front while it projected and say why they did this. Nice. Uh, I want to play another clip now. This is uh, Marta Yankovic, who is an Osgoode Hall Law student. And talking about an engaging classroom, here's an anecdote that relates to that. Roll tape, please. If I think about my high school class, which was, I guess it was called Canada in the 20th century, something to that effect. It was really more about Europe, in a way. It was about the First World, world War, the Second World War, the Holocaust, the Cold War, uh, Prohibition and the Depression and the Industrial Revolution at the turn of the century, but, and Canada's involvement in those wars, mm -hmm. uh, rather. But if we think about all the other major events that were happening during the 20th century in other parts of the world that our youth never had a chance to experience or know about, Latin America, the revolutions from the military regimes. Uh, Africa was going through decolonization and independence movements. The Middle East was completely drawn up in the 20th century. And well, what we about the Balkans? How about, I mean, you were from the there. Did you, well. <laughs> did you get a chance uh, ever during your high school years to come up to the front of the class and just talk about what you would have known about that given that you're from there? You know, I didn't. And I was always really interested in that. I think as an immigrant and as a, a youth from an immigrant family, I tended to have these just curiosities about other parts of the world, including my own origins. And you know, the extent of, of hearing about Serbia uh, was really limited to who started the First World War. <laughs> Reaction, Jack? Wow, I mean, when you're talking about a grade 10 class, uh, obviously Canada has its place in the world, and I think there always has to be that dimension. Mm -hmm. But there's a real danger. Uh, we were talking earlier about teacher qualifications. Uh, the thing I've struggled with, and I've been teaching over 20 years, and I've had a lot of student teachers, is the biggest thing I struggle with is I've had a few who have absolutely no background whatsoever in Canadian history. 
their formation is in world history or in a particular country overseas and that has its value but we're the frontline players to sell our nation's story and uh, we need to entrust that to people who've got the right formation so that first and foremost you know, we shouldn't apologize. We're Canadian. We, we need to get out the story of Canada. And Canada is a story about many people coming to our country. But the, the stage is Canada. It, it, it has its moments where Canada's story goes overseas, clearly. And we have to bring that into the story. But we can't forget where the stage is. And the stage is here. And we need to teach our, our children our story. Uh, as diverse as it is, it should be a Canadian story. But Marcy, and you heard that observation that there, there are a lot of things going on in the 20th century that perhaps Canada was not at the fulcrum of. And that, she, you know, for her, for her educational experience, she didn't learn very much about all those other things. Okay. <laughs> um, if, you, if you do look carefully at the curriculum, Yes, guilty is charged. Uh, we do tend to focus a lot on our relationship with Europe. So we do focus on World War I and World War II. We do talk about the Cold War, and we do talk about NATO, and we do talk about the formation of the UN, and we don't have much time to discuss the Middle East or South America or Asia. Africa, we don't. We of, don't. Yes. It, and I don't know if it's because the curriculum always sees us as a middle power, Rather, I mean, obviously not a superpower. Um, I don't know. I don't really know, though. It's appropriate to talk about that in the grade ten history credit. There are other history credits that we do offer high school students that talk about those subjects in greater detail, and that we do give them the weight that they do deserve. But let's take a look at the grade ten history credit. The credit is about grade ten history. It is not about Russia. It is not about South Africa. It's about. Canada's curriculum. It's about our story, as, as Jack mentioned. Okay, but Neil, is that adequate in a world, in a province, where increasingly we've got people that you're educating who come from all over the world? And to know just about Canada in a world where a lot of your students increasingly are citizens of the world, not just of the country, Sure. does that get it done? Well, let's make history compulsory. Let's, uh, let's, let's call it for what it is. Uh, uh, I think, and Jan may correct me here, uh, there's only two provinces in the country that have a compulsory uh, history credit in high school. Which are they? Which are Ontario and, and Nova Scotia. And Quebec also. Quebec, I'm sorry, yes, Quebec as well. So thank you for correcting me. Um, but, but let's call it for what it is. I think there's a tremendous opportunity. And I, you know, Marta's a success story there. Let's say, let's say Marta's a, you know, a pretty savvy young lady there. Uh, who clearly has questioned and clearly has engaged in history. And, you know, al although it may be taken as a bit of a critique of what happened in her grade 10 history class, she's clearly become motivated about history. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I, I would say whoever her teacher was, job well done. But let's make the argument that history needs to be a little broader in the curriculum. Let's make the argument that liberal arts have been under assault for the last few years by a math science bias in our schools. And wherever that comes from, we can talk for another hour about where that comes from. But let's say that I think she's making a pretty provocative argument that we should have more history in the high school where those things can be uh, uh, pursued. And that every high school, if it has a pathway for math and science, should have a pathway for history. And that students should be pursuing a history pathway right through to graduation. And we're going to have better informed students and better informed Canadians if we have that. Jan, she, yeah, please, Jeff. Actually, uh, I think some of these issues are already being addressed. We have a civics course where we talk about world issues and global, the idea of global citizenship, and it is a chance for mm -hmm. students in grade 10 to look at their citizenship as something more than Canadian specific. It's for us to be aware of what's going on in the rest of the world. So I think there is still that dynamic mm -hmm. that allows for these other areas not to be neglected, but actually to shine a light on them and look at our relationship with them and what's wrong with that relationship and what's right with that relationship so that we get a bit of a sense of where we're going so that when we do release them on the world as citizens, they, uh, they will engage more because they've at least had some exposure. Marcy? Okay, so you're absolutely right, Jack. Civics is the perfect opportunity to do that. And civics is a compulsory credit. It's a half credit that every kid must finish by the time they finish grade 12. However, what frustrates, we talked earlier about qualifications. Talk about a place principals like to toss people. Oh, you have a citizenship. You get to teach civics. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. And again, for a teacher who maybe did a degree in poli-sci or in economics or in history, they just toss the civics classes to whomever is a warm body and put them in front of, the, of there. 
that's a wasted opportunity for us to speak to kids to talk about what it means to be a citizen in Canada, what it means to be a global citizen. And again, it's, it's one that is assumed that anyone can teach it. And it's a wasted opportunity because so many kids come out of civics class and they say, I think I want to take grade 11 law or grade 12 law or I want to take poly, pol politics and I want to take grade 12 economics because of the things I learned in civics class. If you don't have an engaged civics teacher, mm. you are losing your clients. Literally, they're mm. walking out the door. And they're not only walking out of the door of taking classes in Canadian World Studies, they're walking out of the door of what it means to be an informed, engaged citizen. They begin to believe that politics is a no-win situation, that they never have an opportunity to have a say in what happens in their community. So I would say grade 10 history and grade 10 civics needs to belong to the history teachers or the poli-sci teachers or the economics teachers. As opposed to being a repository of oh, oh, whoever's oh, available. Well, we, ha we have a space for you. <clears throat> no, uh, it, no, that's enough of that. Let me, uh, Jan, uh, bring you in on the, uh, one of the points that Marta was making in that clip mm -hmm. about the fact that here, here's a woman who was born in Serbia, mm -hmm. came over to Canada at the age of five, uh, and I'm, I'm just curious as to what your approach would be on this. If you had somebody who was in your class who was from a part of the world that you might be studying, what do you do with that? It's, it's a combination of things, because part, I don't think you need to throw out the curriculum with the bathwater, because I actually think the curriculum has an important place to help us understand where, as a collective, I mean, as a, as a province in this case, what we want our students to, have to be able to think about, know about. Doesn't mean that all expectations are equal, because they're not. You know, and, and teachers make those professional judgments. And I think, I mean, my, I often have students, I mean, how can you teach in Toronto and not have students from other parts of the world by definition, mm -hmm. although I taught in the north and not so much. Um, so I think you ought to find a way to kind of find that opportunity. And in, 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 it doesn't have to be the whole course, though. I mean, I think it's just a moment of time. I, as I just said, I just finished teaching World War II. Mm -hmm. I have a student born in Japan in my class. So, of course, he was born in Japan in, how, how old is he, 15? You know, not that long ago. Mm -hmm. um, so he, of course, has no context to that part. But he understands when we talked about the internment of the Japanese Canadians. But and would you be in a situation where, if Marta Yankovic yeah. was one of your students, would a teacher ever say, and it was your ancestors, it was, you, it was a Serb <laughs> oh, yeah. like you, who started World War I? Do you do that? Okay. Well, I mean, well, it kind of depends on the what part. You know, I mean, and I've, I have had students born in parts of the world where you're dealing with sensitive issues, some of them more recent, i.e. Afghanistan. You know, I mean, that's a much more likely um, scenario right now or other parts of, of the um, Arab world and things like that. I mean, that happens all the time, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't, and you have to be sensitive to that, but you can't not, you don't, you don't want to ignore the history because it's part of what you're talking about. But you want to, you hope you have a, a relationship in your class that kids can be empathetic to, I mean, we're talking about Japan. Japan was the enemy of Canada during World War II. Mm -hmm. So I don't want my students to think that my student is the bad guy. Mm -hmm. I want them to understand what were, the, what were the perspectives of people at that time that led to those decisions and, how, and what happened in Canada afterwards, you know, i.e. the apology and things like that. But yeah. I mean, you know, you want to kind of get, you don't want kids to understand that there's perspectives of the time period that led to decisions. But that's what I'm wondering, Neil. I mean, yeah. on, on the one hand, you can really bring it home if there's somebody from a particular yeah. ethnic background mm -hmm who's involved in the story. On the other hand, you don't want to marginalize them or, or single them out for complicated attention. How do, well, how do you walk that tightrope? Well, I, I think we, you know, we live in a culture, I think, which, which uh, does a lot of presentism uh, on, yes. a, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis. And I, I think one of the things you have to, you have to do as, a, as a, a thinking, breathing teacher, whether it's in history or any other area, is to, is to challenge that presentism. And, uh, I've had a lot of students who've come back over, over the years and they've talked about uh, uh, um, how they understand now context better. And they get, they get a strong sense now that, that there are contexts in the world and that as historians we have to, you know, we have an obligation to, to alert them to what happens contextually in history. And that things happened for a reason at the time that they happened because of the factors that were, that were ongoing. And that is not necessarily the case now. So one of the, one of the things that, that I don't think we do a good enough job of in the history classroom is that notion of anachronism. You know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the things, are, things get out of date. Yeah. Uh, and that because they're out of date, you have to talk about how it got out of date. And so you have to talk about progress. And that gets to the skills of what, of what a historian uh, does on a regular basis. 
We don't do that well enough in the classroom. We probably should. And with a young lady like that in the class, obviously, that's a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful gateway to do it. Hmm. Let's can play I, can I just add on one that last though? thing. Sure. I mean, when you talk about the war, again, which, and I, I'm so not a military historian, so it's funny I keep using those examples, but um, in, in Nazi Germany, for example, and the, the inclination, if you have a German student, you, you have to have students, even though that was like how many years mm -hmm. in the past, to have to understand that how Germany responds to those issues today is much stronger than lots of other countries do in terms of, you know, I mean, and we have Zundel who we deported and yeah. they put him in jail, right? We just said bad, bad guy, right? So we, we need to kind of be sensitive to the fact that, um, and, and, and your point, Neil, about the you know, presentism, I mean, ha understanding the time period and the context, because you're always going to have kids from someplace else by definition of being in Canada. Yeah. So how we find those as, as ways of having those conversations to build understanding of who we are, I think, as citizens, as Canadians, as just human beings beside each other and, 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 and being a part of that collective. You guys have a complicated job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. But fun. Let's do, uh, we have one more clip here from one of the students who joined us the other day uh, to discuss uh, their own particular high school history experiences. This is Andrew Lines, who uh, actually he used to be an intern on uh, the agenda, and he's now a U of T law student. And here's what he had to say about what we're talking about tonight. Roll tape. One of my biggest criticisms of uh, history in high school is that there's just, there's just not enough of it. You only have to take the grade 10 course, and that's canon in the 20th century. So that leaves out confederation. Um, and you do that when you're 13 years old uh, in, uh, in grade 8. And I, I don't know, you're not at the age where you can really understand what's going on in confederation at that at that point i mean i think it's really important to teach it throughout elementary school to get a primer to, uh, to, to, to be moving forward so you can deal with it at a deeper level in high school but a lot of people just uh just basically haven't really dealt with confederation on a deep level at all ruth ann surely it's not a good thing for a student's only exposure to how we became a country in the elementary years. Is that fair to say? No, but it's important that it's there. It's important to start there, but that, what if that's the sum total of your learning about Confederation? It happens in grade six. That no, can't I think be it's good. Seven and eight. Okay, seven <laughs> and eight, but still, that can't be um, enough. No, but um, given that the come, I guess, like I, when I went to high school, it was five years, you've compacted it into four. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, but I think part of the problem is that we don't tell our story well enough. We don't tell the narrative of Canada. We don't tell the story of Canada's people. Um, just a couple of years ago um, in uh, Gray County, they wanted to change the name of Negro Creek because they didn't think it was appropriate. But if you change the name, then you lose the history because Owen Sound was one of the last stops on the Underground Railroad. We don't tell that story well. We don't tell the story of our First Nations. We don't tell the story that if in the War of 1812, if we didn't have our First Nations, we would probably be a state. So maybe mandatory history right up to the end of grade 12? I think so. I know so. you guys would be for it, but... <laughs> but, but I yes. think that the history needs to be different. It needs to be the narrative of Canada. Mm. It needs to be the story of the people that came. So um, at one time, it, it wasn't really a great, you didn't really advertise that you were Irish in Toronto. Right. When was the two riots in Toronto that happened? The St. Patrick's Day Parade and the Orange Parade, Orange parade. In, in July. Yeah. I think we have to stop apologizing for the for, fact that we're in conflict sometimes. No, but we, we have need, to get away from political correctness and, and bring these engaging stories we back We need in. to tell the stories. We need to tell the stories of the young men who went. Why in Newfoundland is July 1st not really a holiday? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's a really good point. Like, like we don't yeah. tell those stories. Um, and though I think sometimes in an elementary school, you, you can, uh, you have a little bit more leeway because I can choose to do um, different things and put them mm -hmm. under different titles so I can read the story of the Underground Railroad as a language unit. I can uh, do, we did a, an assignment with was history and music. They had to pick a Canadian who, a, a song related to a historical event. Give an example. Okay. Um, Gordon Lightfoot 
and the record the, or the record of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And perfect. But yeah. the best one was a student who uh, took Pearl Harbor as their historical event. They found a 1942-43 blues song uh, sung by four black uh, men, the whole idea of that type of music in that particular time. And then he found a rap song by a Japanese-American uh, rapper whose grandparents had been interned wow. out of San Francisco. Hmm. Yeah. Again, because I was allowed to use music, I could teach, I could, could satisfy the curriculum of the music. Hmm. I can do language, I can do visual arts. Neil, across the curriculum. You know, I, the, the best friend a high school history teacher has is an elementary school high school, or <laughs> elementary <laughs> school history teacher. Because they get it started. Well, they get it started, but, but you know, they have, I mean, there's such a, a, um, an opportunity in elementary school to, to sort of bathe and nurture the child uh, in, in, in historical ideas and wonderful historical moments like that. And, and then it becomes such a rich experience for those kids. And whether you bring in the librarian or, or whoever you have in the school to, to, to really make those wonderful moments. What, of course, doesn't happen is we don't make the transition to high school for, for history students particularly easy. And we, years ago when I started, a long time ago, there was still British history in grade nine. And you had British history, not to teach British history or inculcate them with British values necessarily, but because you had to teach the architecture of, of Canadian government. And you had to teach what the nation state was all about. And so British history became a wonderful way of doing it. And kids learned, you know, those magical stories that many of them had been introduced to in elementary school. And then, of course, you took them down the Canadian path after that. We, we, we really compartmentalize the education for a child now by doing a little of this and a little of this and a little of this. Uh, and it's not good. Uh, well, it's not good for anything. It's not, you know, if, if you were training to be a mechanic, you wouldn't want to have that kind of an opportunity to learn how to be a mechanic. We just don't do it in a particularly thoughtful or meaningful way for the, for the evolution of a child's thinking. Jen? I just want to respond to with Anne's point about, you know, grade seven, eight. My nephew's in grade eight right now, and he he's moved on to a different part now. But when he was in the beginning of the year, he was learning about Confederation. And we're Facebook friends, so he's posting daily his Facebook updates about what they have been doing. And he was the, he had the, they did a, a simulation. He was the premier of PEI. And he was most distressed to find out PEI didn't join. And he wanted to rewrite history. Because <laughs> he was, how could they do that? And he truly wanted to rewrite history, right? And by being the premier, he was the leader of his delegation. And he had to do all these things. And it lasted for about two and a half months, I think, in his classroom. Um, and he was, when it was finished, he posted, it's over. <laughs> did you not assure him that they were just a few years behind? He, he did not know, but I mean, yeah. it was just the point that he was, he was so engaged in history. And what does he want to do this summer for their family summer holiday? Go Either PEI. go to PEI or Quebec. Because they're having their 150th exactly, now. Exactly, right? So he's, he's, and his teacher has engaged them in this process, right? That he is keen about history. For a while he was even wanting to be a history teacher when he grew up, no bias of course. Um, <laughs> I was encouraging this thinking, no. But the fact that he, that, that grade A teacher, and she did, she did do the blending in terms of the other pieces of, you know, of the cross curricular piece in elementary school that they, are, they can do. But mostly he understands Confederation, right? And he's well prepared for what comes next in that process. And that happened in the elementary years. That was great. Okay, eight. that's good. Right that's now, good. The, in, in, in Ontario, you don't go back to Confederation until you take the optional grade 12 course, right. um, the Canadian history course. So, and then they go back. So, yeah, right, that's the point. But, but our job, you know, when we, in the grade 10, which is the compulsory, and we have a compulsory course in grade 10. So we need to like, and, and civics as well, to celebrate those those mm -hmm. opportunities because it's not true of the whole country. We got, we got to just over five minutes to go here and let me try another thing. Time flies, eh? <laughs> you can't believe it's gone that quickly. We, we, there's a continuum, right? I mean, in the elementary years, your responsibility is to get them interested in history so they'll want to take it during the secondary years. During the secondary years, your responsibility is to make sure they still love it so they'll want to take it in university or college. You got a PhD? I do. Okay, so you Canadian know about history. this. <laughs> PhD in Canadian history. Dr. Cecilon, very good. Uh, how well are the secondary teachers of this province passing along history nuts so that they'll want to continue to take it in post-secondary? That's a loaded question. I don't want my colleagues what we do to here, sir. turn on me. But I would say that at this point, like any profession, um, the students who are coming to us at university obviously have been engaged at some point. The vast majority who are taking at university, they bought in at some point. 
And I would attribute that to the teachers they had, probably in elementary and in secondary school, who shepherded them along. And so I think that's, that's the most encouraging thing, is that this, the message is getting through to a certain number of students, and they are buying in, and they are excited about the story. So when some people say that they're only interested for 10 minutes about what's going on in the world, I don't buy that. I think that a lot of them are interested in what happened in the past, because the stories are so interesting. They're about people and all these various experiences they've had. Um, I guess the challenge for all of us is to make sure that they're getting the skills. I think that as much as we have to have an engaging skills story... Skills of what? We need critical thinking skills. We need the ability to assess and evaluate what evidence is. What's a compelling argument? That there are perspectives, as was brought up here, there are competing perspectives on what happened uh, in the last referendum. Was the vote stolen or not? I mean, there are competing <laughs> perspectives. We have a competing narratives. Why not present those to the students? And we do, I think, that to a certain extent, but then challenge the students to come up with an argumentative research paper around that and then take that skill with them when they leave because it's an appliable skill. It can be moved to different fields as well. It's not history specific. It can be used in other areas, obviously. Do you have, Marcy, any idea what percentage of the students that you would teach high school history to who go on to take it in university as well? It's not high. I don't, think, I don't think it's particularly high. Um, I also teach law, so I get to connect with them there, and a lot of them, and I know so that more they... more of them take law. Yeah, yeah, definitely more take law. Um, I'd say maybe 10%. And why that would be a good aim. 10%. Yeah. Why do you think the, the other 90 don't continue it into university? Well, you have to ask yourselves, why are we, why are we teaching grade 10 history, and why does the province care that we do teach history? Is it because it, it satisfies the, the, the grade 12 diploma requirement? Um, does the government want us to teach it so, because, so we create little, more little mini historians? <laughs> um, so I think that's a question that needs to be answered as well. I don't think you have to take, you know, you don't think you have to take history in university to love history. I've met many people who are engineers or computer scientists who, who love history as much as I do and who are very knowledgeable, knowledgeable about it. But they may not be taking a course in it. No, they may not take it in, in university. I don't think that we need to use that as a scorecard. Hmm. I think our scorecard should be that we've taught them skills, as Jack said. We've taught them how to read more effectively. We've taught them how to judge. We've taught them how to conduct research, which is a skill necessary for almost every single professional career you're mm -hmm. ever going to have. You need to know how to do good research. Yep. I think that should be our scorecard, not who goes on to study it at university. Having said that, Neil, you'd love it if all of your high school students <laughs> took history in university. Let's sure. be honest, you sure. would. Yep. Do you feel disappointed when, is it as large a percentage of your students, you think, who don't take it in post-secondary? Well, I wouldn't be disappointed. You know, I, I mean, let's be, obviously, there's the utopian world that I'd like to live in, but we all would. But I, I think, I think uh, uh, what Marcy's saying makes a lot of sense. I think we want to create uh, 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 children who are joyful. I think we want to create kids who have some passion and, 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 and appreciate the nation state in which they live in in which they live. And I think at the same time, as Jack says, we want to have some skills there to, to carry them through to a, to a meaningful, engaged life as a citizen. I would love to have kids taking more history in high school. I'd love to see that continue on in the university. But I'm not sure that's, that's the objective that, that, that we have in a liberal arts uh, uh, educational system. I think our, our job is to create a whole child. And, and, and so long as we're, we're on that path, then, then we're doing our job. And history is part of the whole. History is a, it, well, I would argue history is a foundational part of the whole. And, and, and that a, 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 a dearth of history creates that uh, collective amnesia that I think so many of us suffer from today. And so, uh, you know, am I going to be able to correct that? No. Am I going to be able to offer a stopgap or a remedy or a solution? Of course. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, our time's up. But this has been a lovely discussion, and I kind of just wish I'd, at some point in my life, had one of you five as a history teacher growing up, because you guys are all good. I bet you're pumping out excellent citizens for the future of our province. So it's good to have you all in TVO tonight, and thanks for making history relevant, which we all know it is. Oh, and there's one other reason why we should take it. I always say this when we do a program on this. You know, of course, the main reason why you need to take history. It's fun. It's really a lot of fun. Absolutely. There we go. Thanks, gang. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.